Okay. Uh, it's good, yeah. to, good to see all of you. Um, thanks so much for coming. Uh, again. Um, we haven't seen each other in a week or so because of Kanuga, um, but I hope it was a good break and looking forward to getting back into it with you for just a couple more weeks. Uh, I was just saying, I think we have two or three left together. Um, certainly, I think it's three. Not more than that, though. Um, but, but anyway, um, first of all, I wanted to, to, to comment that um, because of a change in my schedule in the last week, um, and I'm, I'm in the middle of my comp exams for my PhD program, and they rescheduled my very final, it's an oral exam, um, it was supposed to be this past Monday, got rescheduled for tomorrow, so um, so I was, I was planning on having more time to prep something like the David session we talked about. Um, I didn't really have that this week, uh, so I'll, I'm going to push that to next Sunday, and today we're going to do a, another song. Um, that's all right with y'all, <laughs> whether it's all right or not. <laughs> that's what we're doing. Um, thank you, thank you, I, I appreciate that. Um, so uh, that's what we're doing today. Um, before we get into that, though, I wanted to ask, sort of along the same lines, we only have two or three weeks left, and with that time, um, instead of following the same format we've been following, which which we may, depending on, on what we decide here, but I wanted to open it up um, to the group just for a minute or two here, just at the beginning of our class today, and just ask you, I think each of you that I see in here has been in the class for at least a couple sessions, if not more than that, um, and, or maybe just one, that's fine too, but in general, I'm wondering, over the course of, of our looking at Psalms together, um, and raising the theological issues that we've seen in them. Uh, have any major questions about the Psalms or about the Bible or the Old Testament or theology um, about God? Really, very broadly speaking, has anything really come up for you that you'd like to see addressed more pointedly in the closing weeks? Or that I could perhaps, not necessarily that I could fully explain or clarify, but, but rather like, I would like to spend the last couple weeks we have being sure to touch on issues and bring materials on issues that <clears throat> you have found either very interesting or very perplexing one way or the other about the Psalms or, or maybe just things that haven't been addressed yet that you're curious about in the Psalms. Um, so I'll put it to you, but does anything, anything come to mind in that regard for any of you? <clears throat> I can't speak to what I don't know, so I can't really say what okay. I would love to see right. because I don't know that. Okay. So I would trust that you would be able to guide us through, yeah, yeah. And, you know, additional. And I would love to, you know, get additional resources and stuff like that to, okay, yeah. to follow on this yeah. fabulous class. That you okay, great. Really yeah, I'll put together along those lines um, for the end of the class. I'll put together a bibliography kind of that will be like for further reading um, on different fronts. So I'll recommend some heftier sort of reference commentaries or whatever, and then on the other end, just some good books and articles on a totally other end of the spectrum and everything in between. I've, I've got some good materials like that, so. So just as a quick mm -hmm. yes or no, should I spend time with Bonhoeffer's prayer? I mean, uh, yes, song? definitely. Okay, all right, <laughs> okay. Yes, spend time with Bonhoeffer in general. Okay. <laughs> um, interrogate Von Hopper, but, but definitely spend time with Von Hopper, and, and on the Psalms. Um, yes, I, just to clarify, um, what I'm not asking for right now is for, for you all to schedule the next couple weeks um, on the fly. What I'm, I can very well plan a couple more weeks of, of reflection on the Psalms that will get us into some, what I think are nice synthetic conversations about the Psalms, but, um, but I just wanted to know if Maybe, maybe it's not something that happened in this class, but maybe just in hearing the psalms in church over the years or, or whatever, some particular issue or something has stuck out that you would just like to hear something about. Um, for my own part, some of the psalms are kind of thorny, and some of the imagery, or some people find kingship a really weird topic in the psalms, or uh, for that matter, one of the huge topics in the psalms is the violence of the psalter. There's, we haven't done a lot of that in this class, but... I was planning on looking at a particularly 
violent song um, as one way of spending one of our last few weeks to get into that. But those are the kinds of possible questions people might have about the song. Uh, or just questions we've left hanging. We've had some great conversations in here. Um, and I didn't want to leave any of that totally hanging if you didn't want to. <clears throat> yeah. For me, your translation, and I might have said this before, but thank you, and more mm-hmm. real to me than what we read in the Book of Common Prayer. Maybe it's mm-hmm. because some of the phraseology in the Song yeah. translations that are made. You know, some of these are just rote phrases you've heard, you've heard so many right. times that it, you just kind of like glass over. Right. So, you know, I mean, oh Lord, wouldn't it be great if we had your little prayer book of <laughs> your translations of the song? Because that kind of gives me new things right. to kind of speculate about. Um, and, and also the other thing is, is that I just really like getting connected to the Old Testament in the way in which you have amended, you know, just the actual song to some of the and all that. You know, I mean, I, I know someone, something about all that, but for, some, for a lot of people, I'm sure, if they just come and they just hear some of those songs in the church, you know, mm-hmm. you know, the context must be a little... Yeah. It, context is missing in a lot of ways. Right. Anyway, that's my main thing. Okay, yeah. Uh, so, with the translation remark, that's something that stood out to you. Is there anything that um, you'd like to hear about more in the last couple weeks along those lines? or Because I'd be happy to talk more about that a little bit if you'd like. Um, and along those lines, when I put together the bibliography, one thing I'll include is a list of recommended translations of the Psalms. Plenty of people have done some good ones. Plenty of people have done some terrible ones. And I'll, I'll list a couple that I think are really, really good. Mm-hmm. Sounds like Gretchen just gave you something to work on. Some of the Psalms are going to heaven. <laughs> that could be good. Yeah, that's right. That's a copy. That's a copy, right? I'm really glad you all enjoyed the translation. That's good to hear. It, it can be a really nice experience. And again, I'll reiterate, this is, I've translated these songs we worked on before, and each of these I've translated again, and it's come out different. So just to reiterate, translation is such a fluid and flexible enterprise. Anyone in here, probably, you work with languages, some of you, modern languages, and just knowing translation is not about, uh, you know, um, how do I say? It's not about perfect representation. It's it's not about mimicry. It's about faithfulness. There's like a virtue about translation. That's a lot more of a. Uh, there's no one way to do it, and yet there are multiple ways to be faithful to a different language. Um, so that there's a dynamicness that I think a lot of people who read the Old Testament aren't aware of going on in their texts. And on the point of the NRSV translation in your common lectionary, um, there's a lot of factors that go into the boringness of some of that language. <laughs> One of them is that the uh, it's not just been, um, those, those translations have not just been produced by translators, they've also been produced by committees on readability, committees on English reading levels, um, on usefulness in public ceremonies and ritual, um, all kinds of things have shaped the way those psalms have turned out, uh, and the other texts in the Bible. Um, an example of one of those factors would be, uh, for a particular word in Hebrew, um, the translators of the NRSV might have agreed they're going to stick to a particular English word all the time for that word, um, in most contexts. So a word like chesed is a really complex noun in Hebrew that gets rendered, I think it's in, in the NRSV, it's going to be your loving kindness or, or something like that. It could be devotedness, it could be committedness, it could be faithfulness, loving devotion, covenant faithfulness. All these terms have such different meanings and carry different connotations. 
And really, the word deserves different translations at different times. So, well, what happens in the, in the NRSV Psalter is you get a lot of sort of road phrases you've heard a lot before. Your, your, loving, your loving faithfulness endures forever, or, or whatever. And you hear that phrase over and over, and you stop thinking about what's actually being said. It just sounds kind of like repeated stock. And I think that translations that don't go through readability communities can, or readability committees can, can often preserve some of the texture of these texts. Uh, so I'll point you to some other translations that are helpful for that. Any other comments or questions on issues that are hanging, or just questions you have about the psalms in general? I've had a lifelong ten tendency to focus on the here and now rather than narrowly. So it's been here that gets me. It just astonishes me the depth of thought and feeling going back so many centuries. Right. And it's really it's, it's 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 wonderful to see that and be mm -hmm. reminded of it. Whatever. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I'm with you on that. <clears throat> well, I I would hope that you would do a violent song. Absolutely. I will, yeah. We'll look at two different kinds of violent psalms. Um, there's, uh, there's violence of human beings in the Psalter that's pretty disturbing, and then there's the violence of God in the Psalter. And we'll, we'll be sure to cover both of those things, because they show up a lot and confuse a lot of listeners. Rightly so. It's very difficult. Um, Okay, uh, are there any other comments or questions before we press on? Okay, great. And Bruce, um, <clears throat> I just wanted to say I completely agree. That's one of the reasons I became a song scholar, um, or I'm becoming one, and I hope to become one. Um, I am amazed over and over again at the uh, at I think that the thing I love most about encountering the Psalms is I'm amazed at human beings trying to say something to God, or people trying to communicate or approach the divine, and that this was this this is what that is a preserved attempt from thousands of years ago to do exactly what we're still trying to do. Along those lines, one of my focused interests is putting Psalms in their broader ancient Near Eastern context, and something that is astonishing or has been astonishing to me find that the Psalms are rather late examples of the kind of prayer that they embody in the ancient Near East. Um, I study Egyptian and Babylonian prayers as well, for instance, and we're talking like three, 4,000 BC that prayers just like this are preserved in, in great numbers uh, from those civilizations, and finding that this kind of spirituality is that ancient, and that the prayer of ancient Israel emerged in a wider context of prayer uh, is utterly fascinating to me and enjoyable. Thanks for that comment. <clears throat> um, on that note, let's, uh, let's go ahead and move to our song of praise today. Uh, I opted for today to, to look at a song of praise that's sort of cleanly a song of praise, not a very complex genre. Um, and I wanted to do this because really what we've done so far in the class is every week I've brought to the class a sort of a new kind of song with a new twist or turn that we haven't seen before. Um, but I wanted to circle back around to one of the most basic genres of the psalms um, in the hope that the spirit of looking through the psalm will feel like, okay, we're a little bit capable. We've, we've seen this before. Let's, let's kind of use our previous conversations and, and see what emerges. Um, from this particular take on a, on a praise song. Uh, so there won't be that much of a, a new introduction to a, a new kind of song today as much as just taking a good look at another praise song. But just as a brief review um, to get us back into thinking about praise, um, praise, let's just, let's just review together like what praise songs do and, and how they actually function. What we said before in the class when we talked about praise is that most centrally, um, praise, song, praise songs uh, begin with a call to praise God, an invitation or um, an exhortation for praise to happen. So they're actually, 
at the core, they're not purely only praise. They actually also involve the question of praise, whether praise is appropriate, or whether it's, whether it's right to give praise. Um, there's an inherent invitation. Now granted, these invitations are given in communities where people don't stand up and say, well, actually I'm not going to praise God. They're, they're given in communities like ours, where the priest says, let's praise God, and we all say, hallelujah. So I'm not trying to point to a literal maneuver where someone's like, should we? And someone else is like, no, I don't know, maybe we should, maybe we shouldn't. <laughs> Rather, it's to point out that the rhetoric of praise itself includes um, this negotiating posture, this, this need to determine what is true. And it sets up the act of praise as itself a bold, risk-taking maneuver of trying to give account for what is real and what's true in the world. It's not just the rote um, regurgitation of memorized formula, formula. It's, it's <clears throat> it is actually itself the poetic project of attempting to render a, a real portrait of how the world works and what that means for life and community, um, according to what we can say that is true about God. And as we saw with some of the praise songs we looked at, or the particular one we looked at a while ago, Psalm 146, the claims we make about God have huge implications for life and community, life with our neighbors, the life of all of creation. Um, who we claim God is friends with, or enemies with, uh, is, has massive implications for our own lives of faith and how we articulate our own faithful existence in the world. So, quickly, I think, just to remind us of what we talked about a couple weeks ago, Praise becomes a much more risky, vulnerable maneuver than I think it's often presented to be in the church. I think praise is often understood as the most, perhaps the most boring thing that we do. It's the same every time. It's all true. We know it's all true. God is gracious. God is good. And these these confessions lose their political, uh, their pointedness, their their provocation, um, and they they stop being starting points for argumentation and negotiation about God and life with God, and they start being end points for our dialogue. Just kind of, well, you said it, there it is, we're done. Um, praise rather sets us off on a conversation about the things it, it proclaims. And it does that fundamentally by beginning with an invitation. Um, as this psalm does, we'll see, Psalm 33, Sing with joy to Yahweh, O ye righteous. Praise Yahweh. Sing to him a new song. These are commands um, or invitations. And then it turns, as we'll see in a minute, in verse 4, it begins to give a reason, to make an argument for why we should praise God. For the word of Yahweh is upright. And then it continues to discuss that. So there's, there's this reasoning going on. There's a case being made. And the community is called to think about the case being made the implications of the case, and to decide whether to participate in the praise of this God through time. Basically, praise involves determining whether God should be recognized as God um, or not. <clears throat> and another thing I draw our attention to about praise is to remind us, we talked we talk also about Thanksgiving songs in this class, which is another kind of praise in the Psalter. Um, Thanksgiving songs, uh, particularly issue from a specific situation of deliverance, or a specific action of God, where God has done something in response to prayer, usually. And the, the psalmist brings uh, his or her praise in response to that particular event, and tells the story of that event, and then says, on that basis, we should praise God. That's a little different than the kind of praise we're looking at today. Um, the basic praise song doesn't issue from a specific instance of God's activity, but rather is as we were just saying, more broadly reflective, and a, a discursive attempt to render who God is for the community and to invite us to reflect on that and confirm it. Um, and that, that is just sort of a central aspect of life in the community of God, rather than something that issues uh, eventfully from something that God has done for someone in particular. So while they're both praise, they're praise for different reasons, and they accomplish different tasks. Because of that, Thanksgiving psalms are often constituted mostly by words or language. Um, and they're both written, but you'll see what I mean. Uh, Thanksgiving psalms, their central piece is to tell a story of what God has done. 
specifically. I was in crisis, I prayed to you, and you answered me. Uh, therefore, my life has been transformed, so let's praise God. That's the center of a Thanksgiving song. A praise song, on the other hand, like we're looking at today, <clears throat> uh, doesn't deal as much in words as it does in making noise and music and shouting and instruments, a general issuing of powerful force from the community um, in recognition that the things being declared are true. <clears throat> so there's a different kind of currency in the praise psalms from the Thanksgiving psalms. Um, what we'll see in Psalm 33 is these calls for instruments to literally make noise, for shouts to go up. Um, you don't really see that in the Thanksgiving psalms as much. It's the story is kind of the, the loud noise being made. Um, but here, it's just this issuing of a shout that's meant to resound with the forceful truthfulness of the claims being made. <clears throat> so that's by way of just brief introduction to get us back into thinking about praise. Um, having made those sort of opening remarks, um, I'd like to turn to Psalm 33 and see what stands out with us <clears throat> on a reading of this particular psalm. Are there any questions so far about what I've been saying or, or comments? Uh, then you all have copies 33, right? Okay, great. So I'll go ahead and read 33, and let's, let's just listen to it together and, and see what jumps out to you. Sing with joy to Yahweh, O ye righteous. Praise is fitting for the upright. Praise Yahweh with the lyre, with a ten-string harp make music to him. Sing to him a new song. Play it skillfully with loud shouts. For the word of Yahweh is upright, and all his work is in faithfulness, a lover of righteousness and justice. The faithful love of Yahweh fills the earth. We're in verse 6. <clears throat> by the word of Yahweh, the skies were made, and, the breath of his, and by the breath of his mouth all their starry hosts. He gathered the waters of the sea as in a bottle. He put the deep in storehouses. Let all the earth fear Yahweh. Let all of them be in awe, all the inhabitants of the world. For he spoke, and it was. He commanded, and it was established. Yahweh breaks up the plans of the nations. He frustrates the intentions of the peoples. The plans of Yahweh will stand forever. The thoughts in his heart from generation to generation. Happy is the nation who has Yahweh for its God, the people he chose for his inheritance. Yahweh looks from the heavens. Yahweh sees all human persons. From his fixed seat he gazes upon all the inhabitants of the earth. The one who forms each of their hearts, the one who understands all their deeds, there is no deliverance for a king in his great power. A mighty warrior is not delivered by their great strength. A horse is an empty hope for deliverance. And in its great power there is no escape. Surely the eye of Yahweh is on those who fear him, on those who wait for his faithfulness, to deliver their lives from death, and to keep them alive through famine. Our soul waits for Yahweh. Our help and our shield is he. For in him our heart is glad. For in his holy name we trust. Let your faithful love, O Yahweh, be upon us, even as we hope in you. So what stands out to you in this song? sense of certainty. Man, this, is, this songwriter, he really believes all this stuff to be there. Mm, right. I mean, just <clears throat> verses 10 and 11 really jumped out at me a few more readings. But we, our context now. Mm -hmm. um, what about verses 10 and 11 jumped out to you? 
Well, he's going to play, break up the plans of the nations. My God, I mean, that's a big order. He frustrates the intentions of the people. Wow, yeah, bring it on. The plans of God will stand forever. It's hard, yeah. I mean, this And I guess that's comforting to a lot of people to know that this is going to really happen. Right. Yeah, thank you for pointing this out. Um, I think this verse certainly deserves our attention and doesn't get very much. Um, you know what? I'm going to tab it. We're going to come back to it in a minute. <laughs> wonderful verse, and uh, it's important how it functions in the psalm, I think. Uh, we'll look at that in just a second. That stood out to me, too, but more so in contrast that it um, seems like the psalm was talking so much about things that have happened in the past and God's character, and then it's like a hard shift to something mm-hmm. that's happening now, and then it seems like it's kind of a shift between God's character and as creator, and then shifting back to things that he's going to do now and kind of, I don't know, talking about both of them at the same time as right. if they have a lot to do with each other. I think that's a wonderful point. Um, because, and yet another thing that we're going to have, it goes directly with this comment um, about uh, verses 10 and 11. Um, I think it's a great observation. The psalm does certainly deal in Yahweh's past sort of more, it's almost more mythological activities, right? Um, the, you know, these, the grand cosmic narrative of God's activity in the past and then sort of zooms in to the situation of human beings and political realities, right? Um, to preview what we'll talk about in a second, uh, when we come back to this, I think that's, it's, it's, it's not um, You've rightly recognized the shift from present, or sorry, past to present, and what the psalm is doing, I think, is offering the past as a lens for the present. Um, and we'll talk more about that in a minute when we've heard what stood out to other people. But but those are tightly connected in this psalm, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll talk more about that. Thanks. <clears throat> what else stood out to y'all? So from verse six on, mm-hmm. it seems it, it tracks directly with the first books of the Bible, right? It, you know, Genesis, um, the word, mm-hmm. the world was created by the word, right? Um, and then, and then God breaks up the plans of the nations and and, and intentions of the people. You know, you know the flood of the days of Babel, and um, right? And then into Israel and happy is the nation who has. Yahweh for its God, so it, you know it's that referential back to the right. books of the Torah, right? Right. Yes. Yeah. There's definitely exegesis going on in the mm-hmm. first part of this psalm, the past, right? Um, it's specifically here. It looks like it's paying uh, mostly paying attention to um, what we call the priestly narratives in Genesis. Uh, Genesis one, and then it picks up in part of the flood narrative and continues in some of the more genealogical stories at the end of primeval history in the early chapters of Genesis. But you'll notice it doesn't, um, for instance, talk about the garden, right? Or like Adam and Eve, it it sort of moves from cosmic scale to cosmic scale to cosmic scale. Uh, Skipping over that soily scene with Adam and Eve is no coincidence. There's the, the priestly tradition doesn't really include that. Those are two different creation stories, and um, this one seems to be paying attention to that more grand narrative, uh, the one that zoomed out, right? God's activity in the cosmos. So absolutely, and that'll tie right into what we're going to talk about. What else did, did y'all notice about the song, or were you provoked by? I'm not really sure what to do with chapter, I mean, excuse me, with verse 12, because it's saying, happy is the nation who has Yahweh God, the people he chose for his inheritance. So it's kind of like, I'm not sure if that's a um, an active, who's active there. Was it God choosing the people, or was the people acknowledging 
God. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm right. not really sure what to do. That's a very nice question. Um, and uh, it hadn't occurred to me that the uh, that the syntax there would set that up. But this is my translation of a very, um, really very popular verse. Uh, and I don't know if, if any of you recognize it, but uh, the way it appears on bumper stickers and signs in front of front yards and elsewhere, uh, all over the place is, I mean, billboards. I took a picture of a billboard with this first on it, like a couple months ago. Um, that's what I was thinking of. Uh, the way it's normally translated is, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Do you recognize that verse at all? Um, there's a similar verse from Chronicles that says something like, if my people will humble themselves and call on me, then I will return to them, and that's another really popular sort of nationalistic verse. Um, but this is this is one of the most popular verses circulated in our country, at least, as sort of a politically generative verse. And it's normally translated, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, which I think, if I had to guess what the sentiment is behind that, and it's, it's complex um, in all its usages by different people, but... I think in general the verse is perceived to be saying, blessed is the nation who chooses God for its Lord, or, or the Lord for its God, or one way or the other. <clears throat> I'm glad you pointed to this verse, and I'll, I'll point out just a couple notes about what I did with the translation to clarify um, your question. Uh, the, the regular translation, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, commits this problem that I've tried to avoid with, with actually rendering the name Yahweh in these verses um, in the Psalms. And this is one of the reasons why I find this important when reading the Psalms. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord kind of trades in these two words for God that we think refer to the same deity. Um, and we're just like, right, the Lord, God. Uh, it's all the same thing. It's just a kind of way of saying whose God is God, right? <laughs> you know, the one we all know to be God. And in our culture... There's no controversy about who God is, which God might be God or not. Rather, the controversy usually, at least among monotheistic uh, peoples, which most people in America are, um, Christian, Jewish, uh, Muslim, um, the, the controversy is not going to be which God is God. The controversy is going to be, is there a God, right? And if there is, it's one. It's God, right? Capital D, God. That's who God would be. There are no other options. In this context, the claim is different. The claim is, happy is the nation who has Yahweh, specifically, for its God, right? So that's the first thing that I think is important about this verse. The claim isn't just, uh, happy is the nation who is pious and recognizes God and worships God. Uh, there's a, a specific claim that ties directly into the praise of this psalm, right? Because the psalm is about the character of this particular God. So the claim in the middle of the psalm is, having Yahweh as your God, as a country, is a good thing. <laughs> Having other gods, um, Marduk, Kos, uh, however many you could list from the ancient context of ancient Israel, real gods they were aware of, and by the way, gods of nations more powerful than they, the gods of nations that they were subject to, um, in that context, they're making a claim about a deity not so popular on the political stage. Happy is the nation whose God is Yahweh. Specifically. Um, secondly, more to your question um, <clears throat> about choice, I think the verse is uh, when you understand it with part B of the verse, which you never see on billboards, <laughs> ever, um, the people he chose for his inheritance. And if you do, it's just an even greater travesty of terrible reading. But <laughs> uh, to think that America is, is the, the people he chose for his inheritance. Um, it is clearly Israel being discussed in this verse. Absolutely, the people Israel. There is no other nation being referenced here. Um, this hymn is an Israelite hymn about a God who chose Israel. And Israel's central gospel is that God chose them um, and called them to be his own people. So happy is the nation who has Yahweh for its God. It's a celebration of that choice by God of Israel, certainly. Um, the people he chose for his inheritance. The fact that he chose them has the consequence of Yahweh being their God. And that's that's the sort of repeated formula in Deuteronomy in particular. I will be your God. You will be my people. Um, so Israel has Yahweh for its God. 
is the sort of payoff of the covenant that God makes. So the two points would be, this is specifically about Yahweh, this isn't just some generic statement about piety. And secondly, this is a claim for Israel, specifically, um, celebrating God's choice of Israel. We can talk more about this in a second, if you'd like to, um, but the, one of the important things I would say, in case we don't get back to this, is that just to be clear, now you know where this verse came from. <laughs> it comes from a song making a very specific claim, and when it shows up in other contexts, uh, attempting to celebrate something other than this, it's, it's really doing something deeply unfaithful um, to the original context of the verse. I, I have nothing to say at present, like in this moment, I'm not saying anything about whether or not God is related to America in any particular way. That's a different conversation. What I'm really trying to say for us is this verse is expressing a specific theological conviction and shouldn't be uprooted from that context. It plays a particular role. It makes a particular claim. And uh, when we talk about the plans of the nations and all that, um, this <coughs> further context for the right reading of this verse would be that if America gets mentioned anywhere in this song, it's not in verse 12, it's in verse 12. <coughs> Verses 10 and 11, <laughs> um, in my opinion. And I would be surprised if most people who have this verse in their front yard have read verses 10 and 11. <laughs> um, so, uh, did that answer your question about choice and yeah. what's going on in that verse? <clears throat> it's a complex verse and it's important to the song, so I wanted to give that a bit more reflection. <clears throat> Anything else stand out to you before we move on to? Verse 17, I don't stick out in your statement. Okay. It's about the horse. Right. So, what's happening there is um, you have this claim, you have the, these claims, verses 12 through 15, are making about, about Yahweh's effectiveness, right? Yahweh's dependability and really Yahweh's control over things. Um, the, uh, the power Yahweh has over the world. There's a shift suddenly in verses 16 and 17 to claims about kings and their power and mighty warriors and their strength and horses. Horses being the equivalent of tanks in our world. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, <clears throat> of military might. Um, and great power, right? This is really being set up, verses 16, are being set up as a as a sort of introductory contrast to what comes in verses 18 and 19, right? Um, <clears throat> Yahweh is the one keeping watch in contrast to these peoples whose powers can be shown to be futile in the end. Yahweh is the one whose eyes on those who fear him. <clears throat> and why does Yahweh watch? It's not, uh, at least according to this song, Yahweh's watchfulness in the world, his power in the world, unlike perhaps kings or or armies, or whoever, who, who really watch to police their territory, their worlds. They, they watch to, to keep an eye on rebellion, right? They watch out for uh, territories being lost, or things going wrong in the corners of the empire, or whatever. That's what armies and horses and soldiers are good for um, in this context. It's not those people who have the real power. It's this God, whose watchfulness and power aren't for the sake of policing, um, and stifling rebellion, but rather, verse 19, to deliver, right? To deliver the faithful, to keep them alive through famine. Yahweh is watchful because Yahweh is committed to rescuing his people when they're in danger. So this psalm celebrates the contrast between Yahweh's kind of power and the kind of power that ancient Israel is experiencing under the Neo-Assyrians, and later the Babylonians, and later the Persian imperial power, this defensive imposter, um, rather than providential and uh, committed. Does that help at all with what's happening there? Um, if it's all right, then let's turn back to, to this great issue that was raised by a couple comments um, that I think is so important for the song and how it works. This issue of uh, sort of centered around verses 10 and 11 were brought up. That Yahweh breaks up the plans of the nations, which I agree is an amazing claim. And uh, 
one question that we can keep in the air, if you'd like, uh, that always jumps out to me in this song is, holy cow, do we really believe this? <laughs> this, is, this is crazy. And uh, how on earth do we move that claim out of its psalmic language and into real descriptions of God's activity in the world today? If this is a real claim that we're making as a community, what does that look like? What does it mean that God breaks up the plans of the nations? Um, tab in that, but, but it's truly a powerful claim. I'm agreeing with that comment. Um, but thinking in terms of the sort of macro structure of the psalm, and, and Megan pointed out the sort of creation and exegesis going on, and, and you pointed out, Katie, the, uh, the sort of parts of the psalm, which I agree, I think they're there. Um, that the psalm is doing a reflection sort of on who God has been, and what the implications are now, or what that looks like now, which is is really nice, I think. Um, it's a nice move in praise language for us to remember how to do in our own praise, uh, simply because I think sometimes we don't know what to do with um, praise that engages God's more mythological traits, uh, creator, um, the one who scattered the people at the Tower of Babel. You know, what, how does that relate to uh, how we praise God in the midst of the 2018 elections? You know, what does that really look like? Uh, how do we attach those two things together? I feel like sometimes it, we, our thought feels bifurcated in the church, where we're like, we can kind of meditate on how cool these stories are about God, but over here we can talk about the political and ethical implications. And this song, I think, models how they're related by showing us that, uh, at least I think, just as a um, kind of thesis for how to understand this, I think the creation story here is being exegeted as itself an evidence for the fact that God has an effective word. So that's the first main claim being made about God, right? We talked about how the song is an invitation to praise. Why? Verse 4, for the word of God is upright. The word of Yahweh is upright. All his works, all his work is in faithfulness or truthfulness. It's sure, it's firm, right? It's straightforward. It has effects in the world. And therefore, we should recognize God as God, because God's word issues in productivity, in generativity. Things happen when Yahweh speaks. Some rulers try to speak, and they think things happen. The psalm says, God, his word has effects. Therefore, we should recognize Yahweh as God. Um, the creation story is then the ultimate example for Israel of God's effective word. And they're claiming in the midst of a world in which they are not in power, um, and really never have been, but, and never will be again, um, in which they don't, they don't claim other kinds of supremacy. They point to their God and say, this God created the world, created human beings, first of all. And second of all, he did it with the word of his mouth. His word is effective, it's powerful, and that's the ultimate praise you can give a king or a ruler in the ancient world, to say that when they speak, things happen. Um, it's, it's to say that they really do have ultimate control over how things turn out. Um, so first of all, the creation story is being, I think, used as a model for proving that Yahweh is an effective ruler, um, and that Yahweh's word has effects. Um, but more importantly, um, I think that it's also a model for how, and, and this will challenge the way we think about creation quite a bit, I think. Um, creation for us, especially in Genesis 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, is often understood in the Christian tradition today as what we call creation ex nihilo, or creation out of nothing, right? So that means there was total nothingness, and God spoke, and let there be light, and things, substance was created for the first time, right? Um, there was nothing before that except God. Genesis 1, when read more closely, um, is, is not a picture of that. Um, rather, it's a picture of a deity working with a formless, shapeless, watery chaos, a sort of mass of chaos that exists already, a dark pre-order um, that the deity, that God, has the, the potential to shape and form and create something out of. So swirling in this chaos, this dark void of, of formless mass, 
is generative potential. This is part of the mythological framework of all the peoples of the ancient Near East, including Israel. That creation is not the result of, of an ex nihilo command. Rather, creation is the work of one who had the power to form the chaos and generate order from it, to bring order out of chaos. So to look at the creation story isn't just to talk about how powerful and impressive God is, but rather to see Yahweh as particularly involved in the activity of bringing order out of chaos, right? And even more importantly, if you look at how it's executed uh, closely, you get, in verse 6, you get, by the word of Yahweh the skies were made, by the breath of his mouth all their starry hosts. That's the generative part, creating things, ordering things, putting things in their right place. The stars belong here. This is their time and place. But then in verse 7, it's sort of the negative contrast. He gathered the waters of the sea as in a bottle. He put the deep in storehouses. The waters in the deep, the tehom, is, is a word from Genesis 1, um, where Yahweh's ruach hovers over the deep, the, the tehom. Um, the deep is the ultimate symbol of chaos. I mean, we still think of it as such, this deep, mysterious, dark waters of the earth, right? This is Yahweh ordering chaos, putting chaos where it belongs. So when God creates in Genesis 1, God doesn't just put things where they go. God also puts chaos where it belongs. God doesn't destroy chaos or annihilate chaos. Rather, things go in their right places. So the power of using the creation story here is to say, out of chaotic uh, nothingness, where things aren't in their right place, Yahweh has effective power to bring order out of that. And this is written by a people in a situation of chaos, of deep chaos, in their, in their world. Um, their political realities, uh, in their land, which is void and, and defeated, um, with nowhere to settle. The claim here is, Yahweh isn't just powerful, Yahweh is wise and crafty and creative, and knows how to, to work well with creation, to bring about good and order out of it. See a hand, yeah. So <clears throat> when I look at verse 10, my thought is that you know, God, God doesn't just break up <clears throat> the plans of nations, God breaks up the plans of individuals. And I, I was talking with somebody recently, I don't remember exactly what the conversation was, this person said, Well, you know the old saying, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. <laughs> right. And that's, that's, right. Uh, and that's you know, that's a good observation. But uh, coming from my agnostic point of view, I don't know if it's God at work in the world, or if it's, if it's randomness at, at work in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, that's um, the debate that's going on, right. ongoing, ongoing. But certainly, um, and it's kind of, it's, I, I think of human beings as very fragile and frail, and you know, and right. our, our plans are very likely to yeah. not work out the way we think they will. Right. Reminds me of that. Yeah, so I mean, these verses 10 and 11 are, are part of the culmination of this claim, right? Yeah. And, um, the earlier, I think you're right, Megan, there's, there's exegesis going on with parts of the first part of Genesis here, as well as seeing in their own world um, chaos, the plans of the great nations. There's, there's reference to these the stories of the end of Genesis 1 through 11. Uh, Babel in particular, which is absolutely a pun on Babylon, um, is sort of a reference to this great, great effort, this imperial effort. Um, the idea being that God shatters those plans. In contrast, at the beginning of Genesis 12, 1, the next thing that happens, calling just a, a wandering farmer, right? Um, Abraham is the next thing that happens. Uh, choosing Abraham as his own beginning of people, of promise, uh, in contrast to this great effort. God starts over with this one uh, one wandering Aramean, right? And the claim there being <clears throat> um, that in the midst of these great plans of nations, uh, this God who brings order out of chaos uh, does so with his effective word. And it's, it's this particular God that and the next claim issues from that this people should celebrate is their God, 
happy is the nation who has Yahweh for its God, right? Because this God has the ability to deal with um, the chaos, the plans of the nations, um, and bring bring order out of it. Uh, that, I think, is a very contrasting way of interpreting verse 12 there than it often gets used in our country. <laughs> that this is good news for a small people um, with no power. Uh, and that they can count on this God to deliver them from the overwhelming, impressive power of nations. Um, chaos bigger than them. <clears throat> Any other uh, concluding questions or comments on this song? Yeah. Well, I now have a question to your first question um, okay. at the beginning. With all these songs, I mean, so much is reference to made, is made to other gods or that Yahweh oh, yeah. is a specific god. Like, right. So my question is, what happened to all those other gods? Like, <laughs> where'd they go? Or are they here? Or how do we talk about them now? And, right. Um, so some questions on Yeah, okay. Right, yeah. The, this is a really important topic for the reading the Old Testament as a whole, which, generally speaking, the Old Testament takes for granted the, the very real existence of other gods. Um, Yahweh is one among many gods. And in fact, the claims of the Old Testament are most interesting and most provocative and most powerful if one takes for granted in such a world. Um, Deuteronomy's claim that Yahweh is our God alone is a claim that this particular God. Is our God over against other ones that claim that power. Um, but yes, yeah, I think that that's for that reason. I mean, it gets missed a lot in reading through the Psalms and uh, the effectiveness of, of knowing that, right? Like a verse like verse 12 um, is important to know the kind of claim that you've made. So I think we'll try to touch on that in the coming weeks a little bit more. Thank you for that. All right. Thank you all so much for your attention and contributions today. <coughs> I think we will do David next week, by the way, just to get that on the table. And then we'll probably return to violence after that. So is this not going this class won't be happening in the spring semester? Uh, not this not this class in particular, at least not as of now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know what's happening in the spring, but uh, but I think that this class is meant to come to a close at Advent. At least as I was <laughs> Best wishes on your exam. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Stop studying and sleep. <laughs> what they really right. advise. Right. Um, I really should. <laughs> That's actually the one when we talk about violence, that's the one that we're looking at. Um, that song has some powerful violent imagery in it. So, yeah, probably a week after next. Okay. Thanks for being here.